Coming up, I'll share four signs that you are not getting promoted. But good news can help you get promoted. And then why America's confidence in finding a new job is tanking. Let's go. I'm here to help you get better so your paycheck gets bigger. This is the Ken Coleman Show. All right, let's get right to it. Four signs you are not getting promoted and what you need to do about it. Number one sign that you are not getting promoted is you don't have the skill. Two, you aren't winning with people. Three, you don't receive feedback well. Four, you don't act like a pro. These are the four signs. I'm going to break them down a little bit and tell you what you can do about it. Because again, I'm not here to say that you are hopeless, but you will be hopeless if you act helpless. And I'm going to try to help you because uh, these are the four biggest signs that I see in the workplace when people just have got a lid on themselves and uh, you're not going to move up the ladder. You will be left behind and people run right over you. You'll see new people come in less experienced than you make more money than you right out of the gate, come in less experienced than you make less money than you and just zoom right by you. So let's start to break these down. What you can do. Number one sign is you don't have the skill. So we have to ask ourselves, first and foremost, there's a proficiency issue, right? There's an excellent issue. You're frustrated. You're intimidated. You know, if you're just honest with yourself, you know, I I don't, I don't have the skill to pull this off. So we have to ask two questions. Is this a talent issue or is this a training issue? Is this a talent issue or a training issue? So I'll pick on myself. Uh, I love sports, played sports my whole life. And in the seventh and eighth grade, I tried out for an AAU travel basketball team because that's what you did. If you played basketball and you cared, part of your growth is you wanted to play against the best. And, and it also helped you with your current coach, maybe getting more playing time and You just wanted to see if you were the best, and I wanted to be the best. I wanted to be the best point guard I could possibly be. So I tried out for an AAU team, which is just a travel select team, and they take the best players from from regular teams, local teams, and they put together an all-star team, essentially, and they travel. And so it's above and beyond your current school team. So I went out and I tried out. And it was obvious to me right out of the gate. Obvious to me that I did not have the same skill level as other players. So in that moment, as a 7th, 8th grader, I said, all right, I uh, am not as quick as some of the other point guards that I'm playing against. I can't jump as high as some of the other point guards. And those two skills matter because I'm short. And I assessed properly at that age. I cannot control my height. I think I can control the ability to get quicker and jump higher. Well, I found out that one of those two things was right. There were some drills that I did and I began to get a little bit quicker and I saw some growth there. But uh, unfortunately, the fast twitch muscles in my legs are non-existent. Thank you, God. I appreciate that. Didn't get that. Thank you, God. I'm, I'm trying to be grateful for other things you gave me, but he didn't give me that. Bob. And so I bought those stupid shoes. And uh, back in the 90s, uh, well, this would have been the 80s. Back in the 80s, there was a shoe that had this like, think of a woman's high heel shoe. A platform is on the heel. Well, these shoes, the platform was on the toe. And and I saw an ad for them in Sports Illustrated. So of course it was legit. And I talked my dad into buying these stupid shoes. And essentially you walked around and it put all the pressure on on your toes. And so it was the idea was going to build your calf muscles so you could jump and dunk. And so I got it. And I realized that no matter how much I trained my calf muscles and everything else in my body, I was not going to be able to dunk. So the question here is, is this a skill issue or a talent issue, 
right? I said, and, and when it comes to this, it's like I I didn't have the actual physical talent to be able to be super quick and jump high. So back to the question on a skill thing, is it a talent issue or a training issue? And in this case, my point is you have to have the raw talent to then turn it into a skill, right? Fast twitch muscles, learning how to jump properly, you can jump really high. I didn't have the ability, no talent, so sorry, got to move on. If you have the talent, then it becomes a training issue. So you got to ask yourself, if you're struggling in proficiency and excellence, is this a talent issue or a training issue? In other words, do I have the talent with the training, then I can get better. But if I don't have the talent, no amount of training will do it. Second sign that you're not going to get promoted. You aren't winning with people. Now, this you can deal with. This you can get better on. I don't care who you are. Um, you're not winning with people. You aren't likable. Uh, for any manner of matter of reasons, you are unhealthy in the way you interact with people. You you and you're just you're just unaware of it. And when you become aware of it, you're not doing anything about it. You don't think winning with people matters, or you have no idea that you aren't winning with people. You're walking around oblivious. Both of those things are hurting your likability factor, which is huge when it comes to your promotability. Number three sign that you aren't getting promoted. You don't handle feedback well. Let's just say this last example, the second sign, you don't, you're not winning with people. Let's say somebody sits you down and go, hey, you're not winning with people. You're losing, and here's how you're losing with people. And you look them right in the eye and go, I don't agree with you. Or, I don't care. This is not receiving feedback well. And I got news for you. You will not be promoted. In fact, this person Who's not winning with people? The only way they get promoted is if everybody else quits. <laughs> or there's an apocalyptic situation and they're the last one standing. I mean, I'm just telling you, this is huge. Uh, the person who just doesn't receive feedback well, they're not getting promoted either. They're just not. In other words, they're not coachable. And so we just looked at the last two signs. One was likable. The other one's coachable. If you're not likable or coachable, I got news for you. You are stuck by your own doing. Now, the good news is, is if you learn to receive feedback well and go, gosh, it hurts, but it makes me better, right? If, if, if I break a bone or tear a ligament, surgery hurts, it makes me better. Therapy hurts, it makes me better. So you've got to start to look at feedback as this thing that does sting, it does hurt, but it will make me better. And now, if all of a sudden, if you begin to embrace feedback that way, still going to hurt, still going to suck. But if I see it as it makes me better, then all of a sudden I begin to receive it well. Number four, the final sign that you aren't getting promoted, you don't act like a pro. And the best way I can lay this out is professional athletes they eat right. They exercise right. They watch film. They're constantly getting better. They are avoiding stupid moves. Real pros. Now, yeah, there's a phrase in sports called, he's a pros pro, or she's a pros pro. There are bad actors in the NBA and the WNBA. But a pro's pro in the WNBA or the NBA, right? She's a pro's pro. He's a pro's pro. I don't care what sport we're talking about here. Is that they don't make dumb decisions. They only make good decisions. They act responsible, not irresponsible. They are not selfish. They are selfless. We know the difference between a pro and an amateur. High school athletes... They don't care. They're sleeping in. Pros get up at five. They're in the gym by five. You don't act like a pro. You act like an amateur around the office. And it's obvious. Those are the four signs. Can you do something about all four? The answer is yes, you can. And I've told you what you can do. So take it upon yourself. 
be the promotion that you're looking for. And it'll happen. Hey folks, I want to tell you about Aiden. He started at Bethel Tech two weeks after graduating high school. And less than a year later, he's 19 and working as a full stack software developer. He loved the idea of being able to work at his own pace, but what he really thought was cool was Bethel Tech's faith-based learning environment and being with classmates who had a similar worldview. Now, if this is you, or if you have a son or a daughter that's looking for the next step out of high school, and they may be tech-minded, at least interested, you need to talk to Bethel Tech. Listen to this, Fortune Magazine named them as a top 10 best UX UI bootcamp for 2024. And right now, they're offering you 10% off because you listen and watch the Ken Coleman show. They also allow you to pay cash, and I know you like that. Go to Bethletech.net slash Ken Coleman for details. Terms and conditions apply. What could you do if you knew what you did really well, you knew what you really enjoyed doing, and you had the inside scoop on the results that motivate you? What motivates you to get up and get after? What if you knew all that? The answer is you can. It's called the Get Clear Assessment. Find the work you're wired to do. It's about a 20-minute assessment and then about a 45-minute read to take your results and allow you to ideate on what you want to do, where you can do it. And this is the self-awareness that becomes a superpower for people who want to win professionally. KenColeman.com. Uh, just go right to the store there. You can get the get clear assessment, find the work you're wired to do. This is a great gift, by the way, to that friend or family member who might be a little bit lost, a little bit, a little bit unsure, down on their confidence. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. KenColeman.com and go right to the store, the get clear assessment. Find the work you're wired to do. Uh, okay. Fascinating. As we see Americans' confidence dropping on their professional potential. This is a, a Business Insider article with just some data here. The New York Fed just did a survey of consumer expectations, and they asked respondents to estimate if they lost their job today, what do you think your chances are that you could find a new job within the next three months? And uh, the, the, the probability, the average of the respondents was, people said it was about a 50% chance, just slightly over 50% chance. So essentially, the data comes back that respondents viewed their ability to get a job within three months of being fired or laid off, laid off as a coin flip. This was the lowest mark since April of 2021. Now, if you think back to April 2021, I mean, we're, we're essentially 12 months into the pandemic. And so we're in a really, really topsy-turvy outlook. It was a very different world, as you all will recall. So people's confidence in the midst of so much uncertainty is always going to be shaken. That's just normal. A very profound environment, very different environment than we stand today. So it's really interesting that the number has gotten worse. In other words, people's confidence in their ability to get a job within three months is shaken. And it's getting worse. Why? I've got a couple of reasons. I'll, the article points out a couple of things. I, I actually have my own uh, reason that I that I think is worth learning from, and that's why I'm sharing this. First, what do we see in the data? Uh, there are two pieces of data that this Business Insider article points out that I think are worth looking at. One is remote jobs have shrunken. Uh, or shrunk, I don't know if the word shrunken or not, what am I saying here? Uh, the amount of remote jobs has contracted back to pre-pandemic, so 2019 levels. We saw remote jobs spike in a big way during and after the pandemic, and now we're seeing all that contract. 
Companies are wanting people back in at least at a hybrid level. So what we're talking about when we talk about remote jobs and the number shrinking, we're talking about 100% all remote. That's what we're talking about. And we're seeing this, by the way, on LinkedIn. The amount of fully remote job openings is shrinking dramatically since April of 2022 when we begin to see companies going, all right, we've kind of done the all remote thing and we want to get to this hybrid model. And that's what you're seeing is the dominant reaction is to that. The other reason that is cited here is, is that white collar jobs that are, that are well into the six figures, six figures and above, those jobs have shrunk as well. And this is a result. We began to see this in 2023. We began to see big businesses led by big tech trim their their roles, the payroll. They just trimmed because they had this big boom in the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. And now we, and from a corporate standpoint, and those of you who pay attention to the news, we are in this, what I call a confusing economy, right? We see inflation stubborn. Up, 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 down a little bit, down a little bit, but still way up from where it was. We see consumer confidence up and down, up and down. We see unemployment rate really, really low, but we're not seeing wages grow to the level they should grow. So you've got these confusing economic indicators and all these headlines about it and what it does to people who hire, people who lay people off. They're taking a conservative approach. And so we saw big tech in 2023 lay off a lot of people. We saw a lot of public companies do this because they said, we overhired. And what it has created is a wait and see attitude about well-paid white collar workers. It has also created a, you know what, we're going to get efficient and we're going to combine some roles and we're not going to spend what we spent previously on mid to upper level executives. And so you're seeing that trickle down. But I think there's a bigger reason. I think when asked this question, and understand this is data, this is a polling thing and they're saying, okay, if you were laid off today, what do you think your chances are? And so this, this is a hypothetical, but we can learn something from this. And I think this is what we learned. I think, People have such a squeamish, weak stomach for doing what it takes to be layoff proof and fireproof. They don't develop relationships. They don't keep those connections going. They aren't actively making sure that they have an off ramp. This goes to when we board an airplane, we get on an airplane, we're getting ready to take off, and the flight attendants stand up, can we have your attention, please? You're going to walk through some basic instructions. We are not in any way expecting a water landing, but if we do, blah, 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 blah. If we see just depressurization in the cabin, pressurization, I can't even say it. If that happens, here's what you got to do. A mask will drop, you put it over your head, you know, they start walking through all the things that if there were an emergency, be prepared. This is what you do. I don't think most Americans are in a position to even make it three months without a check, number one. Number two, I don't think most Americans are doing what it takes to have a strong network of people that you stay in touch with, that know their, your value, and not only know your value, believe in your value to the point that they would open up some doors for you and make some calls for you. So I think when presented with this polling question, I think people are looking at that and, and doing a quick inventory of what I just laid out, and they're going, I'm not prepared. And I don't, I don't think it would be a very good sign at all. I think it would be really bad. And I think it's the connection and the network and going, I've not done what it takes. I don't know who I'd call. I'd have to just get out and submit resumes, and now I'm out there fighting against the 8 billion other people that are submitting resumes. See, the game has changed. LinkedIn, online, AI, all the things make applying for jobs easier than it's ever been. However, it's also more crowded than it's ever been. Because think about it. 
Back in the day when you had to go meet somebody and you walked in and you handed them a resume, there weren't as many people doing that. You know why? Because it takes some freaking effort. You know what takes hardly any effort at all? Uploading a resume. Sending your resume to 50 connections on LinkedIn takes mere seconds, minutes. It takes a lot more effort to show up, look sharp, talk to somebody, hand them your resume. So here's the point. If you want confidence to soar for yourself, that you're going to be okay no matter what comes your way, you need to be constantly connecting to people. When you are out of sight, I promise you, you are out of mind. And it is too late many times to become seen when you're in an emergency situation. In other words, if you get laid off, it is too late to start being seen when you only got three months or two months or one month worth of cash or maybe none at all. You are screwed. That's how you show up in the Uber. That's how you're doing all the other things you don't want to do. You know why? You didn't prepare. You had no off-ramp. You had no emergency action plan. You weren't doing what it takes to make sure that the mask would drop. People aren't doing what it takes to connect and build relationships to, to dig the well early so that when you need the water, it's there. And that's what's going on, and that's why confidence is low. So what's the lesson? Buy the proximity principle. Read it. Make it a part of your everyday life. I'm always learning. I'm always connecting. And that gives me the opportunity to be doing a lot of different things. You have to make sure that you have an emergency plan in the form of a lot of connections that aren't, by the way, LinkedIn connections. I mean real-life connections where you're hanging with people, talking to people. They know you. They value you. They will help you. That's how you win in this situation. Every time. It is connections that get you where you need to go. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, if you're enjoying the show and it's helping you help us grow by liking, following, subscribing, and sharing. All right, let's go to Dan in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Dan, how can I help today? Hey, Mr. Coleman, how are you doing today? Good. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing all right. Um, I'm just kind of looking for some direction on uh, what I want to do with my life. Great. What do you know and what do you not know? In other words, be more specific. Ken, I know this, <laughs> or I really need to know this. This one particular thing is holding me up. What's going on? Give me the real, uh, real, way below the right. surface. What's going on? All right. Well, um, I'm currently working a position that I don't really enjoy. Yeah. Um, I graduated from college uh, with two bachelor degrees, one in criminal justice, one in political science. Are you pursuing Are you pursuing anything in those directions? Or um, have you? I was. Uh, I had an internship with a lobbying group, um, and that work I don't think really set, the, set me on fire. Well, first of all, um, has there ever been an internship that truly sets anybody on fire? Internships, <laughs> internships themselves are like I could get excited about the fire I'm standing near, but the, right. am I right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's keep going. I'm going to come back to that. What was your master's degree in? My master's degree is in, also in criminal justice. Okay. All right. So let's just cut. Let's just cut to the chase. Okay. Okay. There was a time when you were younger and you fantasized literally, you imagined a future that got you to the point where you decided to get a degree, two degrees for crying out loud, and then a master's. 
one degree in criminal justice, then a master's, one degree in political science. Those are You can throw a hula hoop around those because I would put them in the category of public service. You still tracking with me, and do you agree with that? Yes, I would. All right, then. So when you were much younger, what is it that you thought you wanted to do that led you to going that educational direction? Well, um, I have a lot of family that are in law enforcement, and I think I kind of like the idea of going into policing or law enforcement somehow. Yeah. It was more than just seeing it. What was attractive to it, to you? What, what attracted you to law enforcement? Even though, I mean, beyond just I saw my family do it. Um, I think the idea of, you know, doing some job where you're not behind the desk at all times and, and maybe you're out in the community, helping the community is, uh, you know, playing your role in helping the community become better. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's a good reason. Do you lean towards stopping bad things from happening or do you lean towards protecting people? Um, I think I would be more so stopping bad things from happening. Yeah, I thought so. Do you know what, how I had a hunch on that? Because of the political science and the or public policy and uh, and the the law enforcement, you know, it's 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 I think you just lean more towards I, I want to stop bad things, not just be there when somebody needs me to protect them. I, I, I'm I want to get to causation. Am I right? Yeah. Whoa! did you hear that, folks? His <laughs> voice changed. Did you feel that, Dan? Yeah. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. So what's the what's the stuff you want to stop the most? Um, I think uh people being taken advantage of or um you know, people getting away with things that they shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Be more specific. What's a what's what's what what are what are some bad people you would love to put behind bars? Um, people that, you know, uh, what's going on? I don't know. It's, I'm kind of indecisive. No, you're not. You're, you're struggling with confidence. Give me the list of people that ran through your head in that moment where you felt like you were stuck. Didn't want to give me an answer. What were the names? What were the types of people that were popping up? Um, I think. People uh, who who use weapons against people that don't have them, or yeah. uh, maybe drugs, so, you know, selling mm-hmm. copious mm-hmm. amounts of drugs to the community, stuff like that. There you go. Now, when you took your master's program, and you are you in the middle of that? Or are you are you finished with it? I'm finished with it. Okay. Yeah. What 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 do you think that was setting you up to do? Because you didn't just you're not a you're not a guy who doesn't think. In fact, I think your issue is you overthink. Yeah, that's so, for certain. So a guy like you doesn't just get into a master's program willy-nilly. What what did you think it was setting you up to do? Well, if I'll be honest, I thought that it would fast-track me to get a better pay in whatever criminal justice profession I pursued. Okay, so it was more about credentialing, not a specific area. Correct. All right, do you want to be an investigator? Or do you do you want to be on the street you know, cracking some bad guy over the head and dragging his butt into jail so that he stops selling bad stuff to people. I think uh, investigative work sounds very interesting. Interesting. Have you taken my Get Clear career assessment? I have. Okay, you got your results? I do. All right, I want to hear them. Let's just slowly walk through this. What What are the top three talents, the things that you do best? Uh, talent number one, communication. Mm-hmm. Number two, inspection. Mm-hmm. Number three, discernment. Oh, man, yeah. Yeah, I, this is fun. Okay, top three passions, things you love to do. All right, passion number one, promoting. Mm-hmm. Passion number two, protecting. Mm-hmm. Passion number three, solving. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a very interesting combination. And then missional result, top missional result. What you results you care about achievement. Mm-hmm. So that tells me 
you've got a little bit of a um you got a little bit of a performer in you. You you are a guy who likes a scoreboard. You like the pressure to keep score. So if you get into this whole investigative side of things, you want to see the needle move. And, and what I mean by that is you need to be in an investigative role, um, but it needs to be measured and your goals are, can I go investigate and dive into something and put a stop to an issue and we want to see 20% less drugs on the street in this community or whatever. I, I think it's got to be something like that to where, because the promoting piece for you is, is this is just the, this is the good person, the evangelist in you that says this must be done. We must stop this problem. That's where the promoting score is, is at. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Has I nothing, agree. has Absolutely. nothing to do with sales has nothing to do with a traditional promoter. It is, we must stop this. This must stop. And here's how we do it. We're going to root these bad guys out. And when we do that, it's a trickle-down effect. Is that starting to resonate with you? Yes. And so the protecting and the solving is just a function of that. Um, And, and then the achievement piece is, is you just need to be measured by it. Right? We, we shut down this many drug guys, blah, 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 blah. So you, you can fill in the gaps here. So I think you got to, I think you got to go the direction of, um, solving systemic crime issues. That's what I think. I don't think you're a one-off guy. I think you're going, if we remove this, this, and this, it drops crime by a huge percentage and then it has this effect on the rest of society. Does that make sense to you? Does that feel right? Yeah, I think it does. All right, then. Stop thinking and start doing. <laughs> you got a freaking master's degree. What does that set you up to do in criminal justice, specifically in the investigation side of things, whether it's FBI or your state bureau in Pennsylvania or in a local sheriff or police department? What does that set you up to do? Uh I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. All right, sure. you know what? Uh, Here's the good news. There's your problem, Dan. You've been doing yeah. too much thinking and not enough researching. You have no idea what it actually takes to do this on the state, local, or federal level. You have no idea, do you? No, I don't think no. so, no. You know what the problem with that is? The scariest thing in the world is the unknown. Yeah. You just need to freaking go, where can I use my bachelor's and my master's degree in criminal justice? What does that set me up to do? You don't know. You're too busy thinking about stuff instead of researching and finding out. So I'm going to let you go right now because that's what you need to be doing. You're qualified to get in. You just don't know where you can get in. You got to match it up to what we just talked about and you'll be fine. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.